Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast is all about our journey into the woods of ourselves, getting to know who we are, where we are, and where we're going in life so that we can create the life that we want to live. It's about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. It's also about mindset. Our beliefs are such an important part of this journey, and there are so many ways for us to change our mindset so that we can more easily live a life of expansive joy. This podcast is also about going literally into the woods and spending time in nature, and how that can help us on our own personal journey of self-knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now let's get into this week's episode. Hello, adventurers, and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 383. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another super exciting guest. I'm really thrilled to introduce this week's guest, Anne Malambo. I recently read her first book, Passport Ready, The Ultimate Guide to Solo Female Travel, and I loved it. It's a quick read, and it's also full of super useful links, making it a great reference for both new and experienced solo travelers. I've been traveling alone since 1994. I feel really old when I say that. And yet, I learned so many great new tips. I learned so many great new websites and just places to get information and to do research and just all kinds of great solo traveling stuff. So I highly recommend this book, and I will link to it in the show notes. Anne Malambo is a London-based marketing professional and writer who's been traveling solo since 2016. She has managed to travel to eight countries in four years while having a full-time job since she decided to hit the road solo. Hoping to inspire women, she used her free time in the UK's first corona lockdown to pen her debut title, Passport Ready, The Ultimate Guide to Solo Female Travel, which is the go-to guide for intrepid women who want to go it alone, but may have some reservations. So what are you going to learn in this week's episode? Here's what we talk about. Things you can learn from solo travel, how solo travel can change your life, the benefits of traveling solo, how to start researching a new trip or your first trip. What Anne does to stay safe on her travels, and this answer may surprise you because I think this is one of the things that women most fear when they think about solo travel. And I think Anne will calm your fears for you. We talk about Anne's top trips for solo female travel, and finally, how to deal with the naysayers who aren't supportive of your solo travel. So without further ado, we're going to get into this episode. I think this is a really, really juicy episode, and I hope it inspires you to either start planning a trip for 2021 or whenever you get out of lockdown, wherever it is that you live, or whenever you're ready. Hi, Anne. How are you? I'm brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. I'm really looking forward to a conversation tonight. So how did you get into solo travel? Well, we have to go back around about four years ago, Mm -hmm. and I was randomly searching the internet. To be honest, I can't even remember exactly what I was searching for, but it must have been something travel-related. And I randomly came across a solo female travel blog. It was actually Adventurous Kate. And I don't know, do you know Adventurous Kate? It sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. I mean, I've been on so many solo female travel blogs because it's a topic that I love, so I might be familiar with her. Yeah, she's like one of the OG solo female travellers. But I just devoured her blog, just one post after the other. And it was kind of through her that I ended up finding this whole community of solo female travel, budget travel, and all of a sudden travel just became so much more accessible in my mind. And I think for a lot of people, they just assume that travel is very expensive, Mm -hmm. that it's out of their reach. But finding this community made me realize that it's actually more within my reach than I ever thought that it was. Because I always loved travel, but I think traveling solo was just never something that ever crossed my mind. I just always traveled with my family. Mm. I assumed as I got older, maybe I'd travel with my friend or I'd find a partner, but I never thought about traveling alone. So after I found the solo female travel community, that gave me the confidence to start thinking about traveling by myself. And I didn't actually go too far on my very first trip. I only went to Stonehenge, which is about an an hour outside of London. And that's one thing that I would say to anyone thinking about solo traveling. You don't have to go far your first time. You can just make it something very close. Start exploring your city or just go an hour or two outside of your city. 
a nice day trip to just give yourself a feel of how do I actually feel by myself on a day out before you take that big leap. And I loved it. Um, I really enjoyed the day. And then I started looking into going a little bit further. And it was ended up going to Budapest, Hungary. And I didn't actually know anything about Budapest, Hungary at at the time. It was just simply a matter of I did the ticket search on Skyscanner and ended up being the most affordable ticket at that time when I was scanning. And then I also took into account the fact the weather was going to be okay, And that's how I ended up in Budapest, Hungary. And it was that trip, I think, that really just catapulted me into the whole solo travel thing. And I've never looked back from then. So what was your first trip like? Were you nervous? Were you excited? Like, what was going on in your head before you landed? I was nervous the whole time. To be Mm -hmm. honest, I still get nervous, even my most recent trip. But I just think it's normal um, when you're going out anywhere by yourself. But as soon as I'm on that plane and as soon as I've jetted off, then I start to relax. Yeah. Good, good. So what would you say is your travel style? Do you like going to cities? Do you like going to nature places? Like what places do you look for? I'm definitely not a big city person. And when I say city, I mean anything that's kind of comparable to London. Mm -hmm. So a a lot of high rises, a lot of concrete and glass. I generally like to be out in the nature. I like culture and I like food. But mostly I like doing anything adventurous. And probably my most enjoyable trip was my recent trip that I took to Thailand and Cambodia because it gave me a little bit of all of those things. But I got to do a a lot of adventure stuff as well. So hiking, visiting temples and waterfalls and and all of that stuff. So I say my top style of travel is adventure travel. Mm, That sounds good. So this recent trip that you did, how long did that last? Have your trips gotten longer or how have they changed since your first trip to Budapest? They've gotten longer and I think they've also gotten a lot more adventurous. So in early days, I did very much stick to Europe. I did quite a few Euro trips, so Barcelona, Rome, Copenhagen, Lisbon. I kept it very close to home. Um, nowhere that was ever longer than an hour or two away by flight. And then I kind of moved up one more step and went to Bali, which was my furthest trip before the Thailand and Cambodia. That was my furthest and longest trip. That was about two weeks. And then on my most recent trip to Thailand and Cambodia, that was one month. So I spent three weeks in Thailand and one week in Cambodia. But that trip I was actually planning for quite a number of of years. So what what is it like for you when you go on a much longer trip, like three or four weeks? How is that different from just taking a short getaway? I learned so many things about myself and I think about travel on this trip. I think this was the first time I would say the rose tinted glasses came off. (laughs) I think in the travel community, sometimes travel gets put on a pedestal a little bit too much Mm. and it becomes the end all and and be all of some people's existence. And And I do think I let it become maybe a little bit, how do I put this? I would say that maybe sometimes travel gets a little bit too romanticized and you forget that there are some downsides as well. And on this trip, it's probably the first time I experienced some of the downsides. So travel burnout, missing home, missing just everyday little normal things started to get very annoying. So not being able to do my laundry Mm. um, the way I wanted to or at a particular time, I kind of had to schedule my whole life because you don't have all of your homely comforts. Um, necessarily when you want them. So I think this is probably the first time that I realised that maybe long-term forever and always travel, that kind of long-term nomadic life, maybe wasn't for me. And I am someone that likes a balance of being able to travel and being able to come back to a home base, whereas being on the road all the time, because I feel like that's a narrative that's kind of um, been a bit overplayed in the travel community that quit the grind and travel the world forever is, is just the ultimate goal. But having lived a little piece of that, I found that it wasn't something that I necessarily wanted. It wasn't my version of the dream. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to learn. I think the whole digital nomad thing is just blown up in the last, I don't know, at least 10 years. And it's just As you said, it's like this ideal thing that so many people strive to, and it's not for everybody. No, it's definitely not. And what's interesting, actually, in lockdown, I've seen 
a lot of travel content creators talking about this and actually saying, you know what, I was kind of losing my thirst for travel and I'm quite glad to be able to slow down and maybe work on some other projects and not be traveling all the time. And you do see people that have been in the travel community for a very long time now settling down, maybe being semi-nomadic as opposed to up and about all the time. Yeah, I think it's good to find kind of the right balance for you, even if it doesn't look like what you thought it was. Yeah, absolutely. So what else have you learned about yourself through solo travel? I've learned that I'm capable of doing a lot more than I maybe have given myself credit for in the past. I think going away and having to fend for yourself, having to budget, having to manage bookings, having to plan your trip, coordinate everything, it takes a lot. And it's why I advocate so much for women to solo travel. And even if it's just the one trip that you do for yourself, do it because it just changes how you look at yourself and gives you a sense of confidence in how you move in the world. Yeah, it absolutely gives you a sense of confidence because you are 100% reliant on yourself. So how have your adventures helped you to grow as a woman or as a person? How have they helped me to grow? I think pushing myself to do things that maybe in the past I would have never thought about doing. Mm. So when I went to Bali, I actually did did a paddy open water. That's the entry level for scuba diving. And that's never anything I ever thought I would do. It was the most amazing experience of my life. I saw a turtle. I saw all of this amazing marine life. Unfortunately, the storm came in when I was due to go to see the manta rays, which are these huge, Mm. I think they're like three, four, five meter kind of stingray looking creatures. They're absolutely massive. So I have to go back and do that. But pushing myself to do things like that. I also did my first mountain trek. I did a trek on Mount Bator, and that was incredible. I mean, we started at 2 a.m. in the morning, saw a shooting star for the first time in my life. uh, Yeah, that was incredible. And we were up at the top by about, I'd say, 5, 6 a.m.-ish. So that's actually got me really interested in doing more hiking, doing more mountaineering, and just pushing myself more physically to do physical challenges like that. So what do you think it is about travel that gets you making different decisions or choosing to do things that you would never have thought you would do? Honestly, I just think you're in a different headspace when you're away. And it's not just necessarily doing challenges like that. It's even little things like just talking to strangers and having to put yourself out there. It's honestly not something I generally do when I'm at home. I'm quite introverted when I'm at home, but it does force you to just, I guess, get out of your box and get out of your own way. Because if you're going to go all the way across the world, why have half of the experience? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember years and years ago when I was living in Costa Rica, I was teaching English there. And I had these Americans that lived in this house next door to me. And one of them would always eat at Burger King and McDonald's. And I would always think, there's so much amazing fruit here and so much great food. But like, she just couldn't venture beyond the known. So yeah, it always kind of makes me feel sad for people that aren't willing to take that risk. Yeah. And I think it's really important to try and immerse yourself anywhere you go as much as possible, whether it's with the local people, with food, with the culture, because you can travel, but still remain very ignorant if you don't immerse yourself in in local life. And I do see that often, people that have traveled quite a lot, but they're still very close minded, because they kind of stuck to the comforts of what offered to tourists. Yeah, absolutely. So what would be your tips on how to immerse yourself in local life? I mean, obviously, planning the trip yourself rather than going to an all-inclusive is the most obvious way, but what are some other ways that people can do that? So, thanks to the internet, this has never been easier. One of the things that I usually do when I'm planning, one of the first websites I actually go to is Airbnb. And Airbnb now has a section separate from accommodation called Airbnb Experiences, and you can book local experiences that are actually run by locals. So these will usually be anything from, say, cooking lessons, the dancing lessons, art classes, day tours, all planned and organized by locals. Also, just when you're on the ground, one of the first places I like to go to is I like to find a market because local markets are generally more catered towards the local people, not the tourists. So you're going to find authentic cuisine, authentic artwork. 
and just have an opportunity to actually speak to local people and local vendors. So those are my two kind of go-to things. Mm, that's excellent. It's funny because I used to run an Airbnb experience in my local area, taking people hiking, but I've never actually been on one and they always look so interesting. So I think yeah. you've just given me a good tip to, uh, once we get out of lockdown that we're going into tomorrow, look at some Airbnb experiences because it's a great way to learn so many things that you wouldn't normally think to do a yeah. workshop on or so yeah. what are the benefits of traveling alone rather than with someone else i think the number one benefit for traveling alone is that you can really make the experience for you if you show up somewhere and you just feel like you know what this isn't for me i'm bored i'm not interested you can move on you can really cater a trip to your interests without having to think about anybody else's feelings really yeah. <laughs> it's really about you and going at your own pace and if you want to go very fast one day slow it down another day it's totally up to you and I think it's also a really great way to get to know yourself and to know your taste because I think a lot of people especially women are so used to going oh what do you want to do what do you feel like doing how are you you know rather than tuning into themselves and really thinking about what they want to do yes yes so what about safety? What do you do to stay safe on your travels? Because I think that's probably the number one fear that women have before they think about going out somewhere new, whether it's to a new country or a new place. I mean, I don't do anything differently from what I would do when I'm at home, because the reality is that being harassed and, and, and being targeted, it's just the reality for women in general, wherever in the world we are. It's not something that just happens more when you're away or when you're traveling it's just something that's unfortunately part of our experience as women and yes you, you do have to be a little bit more vigilant when you are away but unfortunately I, I would say that I haven't experienced any more or less harassment abroad than when I've been at home in my home city of London that's both really encouraging and also, you know, sad that you've had, you know, incidences in your home area. But of course, I think that's probably the situation for most women at some point. Yeah. In terms of safety, the, the two tips that I would say to women mostly is, number one, really tune into your instincts. Yeah. Your yeah. instincts is your number one weapon. And if you really feel like something isn't right, something feels weird maybe you've gone out with someone and they're making you feel uncomfortable don't be afraid to piss someone off don't be afraid to say no to walk away you're never going to see that person again you don't owe them anything I think this is an another unfortunate thing that women do mm -hmm. um, we often feel like we often feel like we shouldn't cause a fuss yeah if you need to cause a fuss cause a fuss yeah yeah that's the thing it's like we feel like we have to be polite we're afraid what's going to happen if we speak up, if we scream. And I think that gets a lot of women into bad situations because they haven't prevented them by opening their mouths and saying something earlier. Definitely put yourself in a mindset where you know that you are going to push back against someone if they try to do anything to you. And if you really do feel like you are in danger and physical danger, always just try to flee the situation before you fight back. Yeah, absolutely. Flee before fight. <laughs> so what are your top tips for women who have never been away and they're starting to think that maybe solo female travel might be something for them? So there's that famous saying that Paris is always a good idea. And what I mean by that in terms of for newbie solo female travelers is go with what feels comfortable and familiar. Yeah. Even if it means going to a place that is very touristy and probably more expensive, at least you'll feel comfortable and you can start getting a feel for what your style of travel is and how you actually feel about being alone. So don't be afraid to go somewhere that's very touristy the first couple of times. And if anything, I would say try and actually stay away from going anywhere that not a very well beaten path because there are certain destinations that are definitely more catered to more advanced travelers and a more experienced style of, of travel. So what would those places be like? What places would you say or what types of places would be kind of catering more to the more experienced traveler? I'd say anywhere where there is a relative um, risk of any type of danger or where you're more advised to take a tour or have a local tour guide. 
So one of the places that I would really actually like to visit is Afghanistan. Mm. So I'm doing a lot of research on that now on finding local tour guides and people on, on the ground, locals that can help me navigate. And I know a couple of other solo female travellers that have actually done Afghanistan solo and are advising me. So yeah, places like that. Mm, that makes sense. So how do you research places? Like, are there any top websites that you go to? Or do you just go on Google and just put in the country and see where it takes you? So yes, the first place you definitely want to go is Google. Google is your best friend. And the first search that I usually put in is what to do in X location. And then that's kind of followed by a whole bunch of other queries like best markets in X location, best restaurants, best sunset views, best free activities. And then I kind of collect all of that information and start making an itinerary based on those things. Other travelers might do it a bit differently. Some people like to wing it. Personally, I say to make at least a rough itinerary. You don't have to stick to it, but at least know roughly what you could see, what you could do so that when you're there, you're not kind of wasting time trying to figure out what to do when you're there as well. So I think somewhere in the middle of planning and letting things kind of flow is a good way of planning your trip. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And also, not everything's open seven days a week. So if you've waited until the last day to go to a certain museum and it's closed, that would be disappointing. So as we're going into lockdown again in the UK, as we record this, what are your travel plans? Are you going to be spending all your time now researching and planning travel for 2021? Or what do you plan to do in the next month of lockdown? So I'm actually working on my second book. Ooh. And yeah, this book is going to be a lot shorter and it's going to be a little bit more, I think, on remaining centered and remaining calm in kind of all this madness that we're going through. And it's, it's a book that was actually very much born of this situation. Mm. And I'm just kind of letting the words flow out onto the pages. It's NaNoWriMo at the moment. Oh, yes. So, yeah, like the whole concept of the book and the moment that we're in and the fact that it's NaNoWriMo, it all just kind of came together. Maybe it's because it's Scorpio season and I'm a Scorpio. (laughs) (laughs) All of these things are just kind of coming together at the same time. But yes, I am working on my next book at the moment. To be honest, I'm not really even thinking about travel. I'm just going to let things take their course and I have a couple of countries that are kind of on my to-go list once the borders open but I don't realistically see those countries opening anytime soon. And that's a really good thing to think about. So my mother keeps asking me, so are you, when are you planning your trip out to Arizona to see us? And I'm like, no, not anytime soon. And she said, but the flights are running. And I was like, that doesn't mean I want to be on them. So yeah. do you feel safe traveling internationally at this time? I mean, obviously, once lockdown lifts, or when do you think you might feel safe getting back to normal traveling internationally? To be honest, I do feel safe right now. There are a few countries that are open. I'm just choosing not to travel at the moment. Yeah, that makes sense. So how do you choose countries? Do you have like a bucket list of places you want to go? Or how do you start planning your next trip? So the first two things that I look at are the price of the plane ticket. And I almost actually always book my trip based on that first. So I look at the plane price of the plane ticket. And the second thing I always look at is the price of the accommodation and the price of the average hostel bed. And the reason for that is that will usually give you a good understanding of whether or not you can afford that destination in general. If you can barely afford the cost of a hostel bed, then other things are probably going to be more expensive, like food, activities, transport, etc. Yeah, that makes sense. So you've recently turned 30, am I correct? Yeah. Yes. Happy birthday. But how do you feel about staying in hostels as someone who's not like 18 year old teenager? Well, everybody seems to think I'm 23, 24. So uh. <laughs> I get away with it. <laughs> I got away with it when I was in Thailand and Cambodia. But honestly, I don't think that age should really matter too much. If the only thing I would say is if you're, for example, going to stay at a party hostel, well, yeah, be prepared for young 20-somethings to be running around like crazy. Otherwise, hostels nowadays, they cater to a wide range of different ages and travel styles. 
There are posh stores now, which are like higher end posh stores that I think attract slightly older travellers. But don't feel off. Sorry, don't be put off staying in a hostel just because you're older. Okay, I think that's a really good message because I was walking the Ridgeway a couple, about four years ago. It was the first time I walked the Ridgeway. I was thinking about hostels. I hadn't stayed in a hostel since 1996. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. But I stayed one night in a hostel and I spent the whole day like stressing about it because I was like, it's going to be like overrun with like screaming teenagers and I'm going to be this old lady. <laughs> and I was so used to like the quiet and the peace of being out on the trail alone that I just thought, how can I handle this? And it ended up being I was one of like three people staying at the hostel that night. And so I had my room to myself because the other two people were men and it was just absolutely beautiful. But I was really stressing about the situation. So I think something I would have to try again, but with an open mind. So how do you know if a hostel is a party hostel? It will usually say on the website and you'll see from the pictures. I mean, if you go on a hostel's website and you see lots of pictures of drinking yeah. and neon makeup and neon clothes <laughs> and... <laughs> happy hour have five shots before 10 p.m then you know it's a party hostel most party hostels will advertise themselves as party hostels all right that makes it very clear then <laughs> so tell us about your first book it's called passport ready the ultimate guide to solo female travel i really love this book because it's a fast read but it's also full of so much information that it's like a reference book that you need to like go back to once you're done and click on all the links <laughs> so tell us about that book so that book was actually born from other women asking me about my travels. And at a certain point, I just realized everybody keeps asking me, how do I travel? How do I travel while I have a full time job? How do I find the confidence to travel? And I just decided, well, why don't I just write a book? And the book really came from other women asking me questions. Well, that's really useful because then you know what's all the information to include in the book and what the questions that people have. Yes. And then actually, I, I had almost finished writing the book. And then around early June is when I got the idea to include these stories of other women. That was never actually an original idea that I had. And there are 26 stories of other solo female travellers and their experiences, young women, older women, women from different backgrounds. And the foreword was actually written by Eva Zubek, who's an amazing solo female traveller and travel filmmaker. She's very much made a name for herself because she goes to slightly more off-beaten path places. She went to Syria, she trailed through the highlands of Mongolia. I mean, she's really pushing the limits of what we see solo female travellers doing. So I was very honoured to have her write the foreword for this book. Mm. And I think it really is very enriching to have so many different stories from so many different women, some of whom have probably been to countries that you haven't been to and have had different experiences. And it just gives a really beautiful kind of rounded perspective of what solo female travel can be like. Yes, absolutely. Mm. So is there anything else about solo female travel that you'd like to say that I haven't asked you or that we haven't covered so far? I would say to all the women who are doubting yourself or maybe you've told people and they've gone, are you insane? Just, <laughs> just to do it and I can promise you, you won't regret it. I've never looked back. I hope that one day I do find my Mr. Wright who loves travel as much as I do and we can travel together. But until then, I won't be waiting around. And I don't think that any woman should have to wait around either. The world is yours for the taking. Go and take it. Absolutely. I love that. And even if you do have a partner, it's sometimes still nice to travel alone. My husband and I often travel alone, go on a long distance hike alone. I'll do you know one of the national trails here. And then he goes off and does his thing. So it's even if you are in a partnership, it's still really nice to kind of go out and travel on your own sometimes. It gives you that time to just recharge yeah, and maybe be more present when you are with that person again. Absolutely. And it's, it's always so nice to kind of look forward to coming home to each other because we both work from home. So we're kind of joined at the hip anyway. We're together all day, every day. So it does give us the kind of nice space that I think normal couples that work in an office or before COVID worked in an office have we have some time apart and then time together. So I think you hit on something really interesting and important that I have seen women talking about online in terms of they're sharing their travel plans with people and their friends and their family are going, are you insane? 
What are you doing? What are you thinking? Horrible things are going to happen to you. So, how would you recommend that people deal with that? Should women keep their travel plans to themselves, or just not talk about it before they go? What's the best way to deal with that? I wouldn't say keep your travel plans to yourself. Be prepared that some people might think that you're mad, but a lot of the times it's coming from a place of being misinformed, and some of that comes from a lot of what we see in the media, right? Yeah.、Uh, Certain countries being painted in a particular way, then you actually go there and you realize, you know, that's just a small group of people that are maybe doing something horrible. It doesn't represent the whole country and all of the people in that country. So understand that sometimes their pushback just comes from a place of misinformation, and definitely let them know about your plans, but don't be too swayed if their reaction to it is negative. Because it's important that when you are away, that you do keep in touch with someone back home, and you let them know your general day-to-day -day whereabouts, and you have daily check-ins.、Mm, yeah, I think that's really important. And I think also the more of us that go out and engage in solo travel, the more we serve as an example and an inspiration for other women who might be too scared to do it just yet. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's something that I've heard time and time again、um, from women, just feeling like they've finally got the confidence because they've seen other women do it. Yeah, and I think the more examples that are out there, the more people are going to think, "Oh, well, maybe I can do this." Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to share this with my audience. Where can people find you online and learn more about your travels and your your upcoming book? So you can follow me on Instagram at on the go with AC. Or on my website at onthegowithac.com, and all the details about my upcoming work and projects will be there. Excellent, and you've also got some YouTube videos of your travels as well, right? Yes, my YouTube channel is also on the go with AC, and you'll see videos of my trips from Lisbon and also from Thailand and Cambodia as well. Excellent. I really look forward to seeing once we get back into travel, all the places that you go. I've not been to Asia yet. I've lived in a bunch of different countries, but there's so many parts of the world that I haven't been to. So I love looking at people's photos and videos of places that I haven't been, and maybe someday we'll go to visit. Oh, you love Southeast Asia.、Mm, yeah, the food is calling me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you found that interesting and useful. Please drop me a line and let me know what you thought of this week's episode. You can email me at holly at hollywarton dot com or find me online and get in touch there. Remember to visit hollywarton dot com forward slash three eight three for the show notes on this episode, including links to stuff that we discussed and Anne's book. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed, at hollywharton.com. That's H O L L Y W O R T O N dot com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.